From the first days of creation, man had dreamed of lifting up from the earth and venturing out toward the stars. The journey began with hot air balloons that drifted through the skies on the wings of the wind and led us to powered flight, first in rudimentary fixed-winged aircraft and then in flying machines that would ultimately go faster than the speed of sound. Meanwhile, visionaries like Sergei Korolev and Werner von Braun were creating rockets that could go higher and farther into the heavens than man had ever gone before. First came Russia's little traveler, Sputnik, which was followed by America's Explorer 1 satellite. Then the Russians shocked the world as Yuri Gagarin became the first man ever to travel into space. Less than 30 days later, the United States began the countdown to send an American into space. May 1st, 1961, less than two and a half years from Project Mercury initiation. Countdown for a manned flight was in progress. And that's a day that you will never forget. Both the public and the press were caught up in the excitement of the space race and the mysteries that were waiting to be discovered high above them in the star-filled skies. That's picked up on us. We're heroes because we uh, volunteered for a program to replace chimpanzees. That's about all I can claim. <laughs> that, that doesn't exactly make me a hero in my own mind. So we, uh, we laugh about that a little bit. In fact, uh, at this time, we were getting inundated with telegrams from the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Stop flying these monkeys and chimps. So finally, we flew Alan Shepard. <laughs> Shepard doesn't tell that story as often as I do. <laughs> On May 5th, 1961, Alan Shepard lifted off from Cape Canaveral atop Von Braun's Redstone missile and rode into space. They called it Freedom 7. Although his suborbital flight lasted only 15 minutes, he became the first American to go beyond the Earth's atmosphere in a space capsule. An American was finally in space, and the country was more determined than ever to be the leader in the quest for the moon. You know, a very interesting thing happened after my flight, Freedom 7. We went to Washington to get a medal from President Kennedy, have a parade with Vice President Johnson, and we were supposed to get out of town that afternoon. Kennedy said at the last minute, when you're finished with the parade, come back, we want to have a meeting, which was totally unscheduled. So we came back into the Oval Office, and he said, now tell me again, how did you react, and how did you fly, and how did you feel, and you know, everything was, was, was exciting to him. On May 27, 1961, only 21 days after Alan Shepard's first flight, President John Kennedy stood in front of the Congress of the United States and took an astonishing risk by promising the world that America would land on the moon within the decade. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. A lot of historians have said, 
Well, and that was a political decision, and I suppose everything that comes out of the White House is considered to be a political decision. But I'm convinced that he was totally involved with it. As far as I'm concerned, it was not a political decision. And I get a call, I'm in Virginia, the president's going to visit Houston, Texas, and he asked me, well, you've got to come to Texas, and I'm, I'm head of flight operations, or that part of flight operations at the time, you've got to come brief President Kenny on how we're going to go to the moon. I said, you've got to be kidding. I don't know how to go to the damn moon. I never heard of going to the damn moon, but I found out pretty damn quickly, I'll tell you that. It took me a couple of weeks, and, and, and I came down here and told the president, how we're going to go to the moon. As I look back on Mr. Kennedy, and he, he was a, uh, he was brought up in a family uh, where they loved challenges. And, and the Russians challenged our country in, 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 by getting into space before we did. And I think he was not going to turn his back on that challenge. He was going to show the world of this country was the greatest technological nation in the world. It seems almost unbelievable. Could it be that science fiction was about to become science fact? Science fiction was really the foundation of space travel. Almost all the people who were interested in space travel, the engineers who made it possible, who speculated about it, Goddard, Von Braun, and others, they were nearly all turned on by science fiction. Space is technology, space is achievement, space is knowledge, but space is a vision. And you've got to go to that next frontier, and if anything, the science fiction writers have helped us visualize what that frontier is all about. A good analogy is the uh, book uh, by Jules Verne. Uh, they took off from Florida. Uh, uh, of course, he used a cannon, we used a rocket, and we took off from Florida. Uh, the, his spacecraft was a shell, a, a you know, cannon shell. Ours was a spacecraft, but both built out of aluminum. He had three people on board. We had three people on board. And, uh, and of course, Jules Verne, that was all science fiction and fantasy. Or was it? Voyages toward the moon and the stars have stirred the imagination ever since the first dreamers wondered about the mysterious world that might be hidden deep within the night sky. There's a uh, well-known phrase, first we imagined what could be, and then worked to make that dream come true. This was repeated many times in the experience of science fiction, that the, the idea uh, came first, and then it uh, transferred uh, to, the, to the drawing board, and uh, from there into the, uh, the metal and uh, electronics and uh, propellants, everything necessary to bring those dreams to life. At first, these ancient myths and legends were passed on by word of mouth from one generation to the next. Then they were written down by visionaries like Jonathan Swift, H.G. Wells, and Jules Verne. And finally, with the advent of the motion picture camera, the world was introduced to such visual miracles of the imagination as the woman in the moon, Destination Moon, and Project Moonbase. Science fiction comes before the science. I think that uh, scientists, having dreamed the science fiction or having read the science fiction or been exposed to it in some way, will then sort of internalize it and begin someday to say to themselves, what if we were to try to do that? The next rocket we build is going to the moon. I'm serious, Jim. Oh, you can't be. It's too fantastic. The moon? <laughs> Impossible. Now that we have a space station, it is at last possible to send a ship from the station all the way around the moon. Nineteen, eighteen, seventeen, sixteen, fifteen, fourteen, nineteen, twelve, eleven, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two. On February 20th, 1962, tens of millions of people around the country anxiously watched on television as Mercury astronaut John Glenn 
rose up into the skies atop an Atlas rocket and circled the Earth three times. During his four-hour, 55-minute flight, Glenn became the first American ever to see both a sunrise and sunset from space as he looked down upon our world from over 200 miles above the Earth. Well, there was a lot we didn't know, and that was the purpose of those early flights, was to, was to find out. You know, Al Shepard did the first flight, Gus Grissom, and they were concerned enough about those. We did those suborbital flights. Those were up and down flights, uh, 15, 18 minutes long. Uh, the, uh, then my flight was the first orbital flight where we'd have extended periods of weightlessness uh, so that we'd get more of a handle on these things if there were major problems. After his return to Earth, not only was John Glenn a national hero, more important, Project Mercury's primary purpose that of sending a man into orbit around the Earth had been achieved. After three more successful Mercury missions, it was time to move on to Project Gemini and another step closer to the moon. We started with Mercury and President Kennedy said, let's go to the moon. And some of us said, well, we'll just finish Mercury and get ready and go to the moon. And sorry about that. There was no way to make that work. We'd never done a rendezvous. We didn't have long duration missions. We needed to start splash down. And we needed to get the whole system up and operating. I think the progression from Mercury on uh, was set very early. When Al Shepard flew that little 15-minute flight, uh, President Kennedy committed us to landing on the moon, which is a very big step. And Gemini was stuck in the middle as sort of a development program. The things we didn't understand well enough yet to really go to the moon without taking the moon steps. So we view Gemini as a, as a stepping stone to follow, but not a program by itself. Project Gemini may have been considered a stepping stone to Apollo by some, but each of its ten journeys into space continued to excite the minds and imaginations of the American public. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off. During the flight of Gemini 4, millions watched as astronaut Ed White became the first American to walk in space. Overlooking the distant surface of the Earth, White swam through space for 22 minutes while tethered to his Gemini spacecraft. The Right now, I'm going on my head. I'm looking right down. It looks like we're coming up on the coast of California. Six months later, in December 1965, the Gemini 7 crew of Frank Borman and James Lovell not only set a record for the longest stay in space, 14 days, they also achieved Gemini's primary purpose by making the first ever orbital rendezvous and docking with their sister spacecraft, Gemini 6, piloted by Wally Schirra and Tom Stafford. Well, on my particular Gemini mission with Tom Stafford, we did a rendezvous with Gemini 7. 7 was up there as our target, and that they were up there proving the vehicle could last two weeks. Now, to go to the moon and back, you need to have about a two-week mission, about 11 days. That includes three days to get there and about three or four days to mill around on the moon and three days to get home. So we had to have spacecraft and humans that could endure that long. We didn't even know that in those days. Gordon Cooper had flown Mercury for about 24 hours. That was it. There was a lot riding on that mission. Because uh, the Apollo was being designed with the giant Saturn V with the lunar module, with the command module, to do the rendezvous around the moon. And had we proved that the rendezvous was very difficult or nearly impossible, that could have had a major impact on the program. It was on to the moon. And as President Kennedy had promised, the Apollo project was destined to put the United States on the lunar surface before the end of the 1960s. But the question that continued to haunt America was, who would get there first? Those were the days uh, in the serious sense of competition. And we were trying desperately to catch up. And I suspect we caught up around the Gemini days and then passed the Russians by a mile. But we still felt they might beat us to the moon. We had that as, a, as an anx anxious time. Uh, they were ahead of us. Uh, no question about it. They were ahead of us time after time after time. And uh, for the first uh, orbital flight, the first uh, spacewalk, the first woman in space, 
Uh, they even landed on the moon before we did with unmanned spacecraft. For a number of years in this, this the space race, they were we were we were eating space dust and uh, doing our best to catch up. And somehow in the mid '60s they faltered, and uh, the technology apparently didn't collapse so much as their engineering management. And this kind of very bitter infighting, which makes our own inter-service rivalry look like uh, a mild disagreement, crippled their space technology and led to their ultimate loss in the moon race. It was not until the moon was viewed by telescope in 1609 that science began to demystify what the poet Shelley called the bright wanderer, their coquette of heaven. Yet for centuries, the moon would remain more the province of poetry and myth than science. We knew Erasmus was wrong about the moon being made of green cheese, but until our first machines touched the lunar surface, we still did not know what the moon was made of. We had photographs from unmanned spacecraft, but our knowledge was fraught with uncertainties and supposition. Then came Apollo, the greatest peacetime mobilization of personnel, technology, and courage ever. Even before the first Apollo spacecraft was launched, disaster struck America's space program. On January 27, 1967, just as the Apollo program was nearing readiness for its first manned flight, a fire inside the command module took the lives of three American astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. Three heroes of the new age would never again soar through the heavens in search of their dreams. I was sitting at this console right here when we had three men die in a spacecraft. And I listened to it. So we've had a lot of pain and a lot of exhilaration in this room. That's right. But that's what anything worthwhile is made up of, isn't it? You gotta have a lot of pain to go along with a lot of exhilaration. And there was exhilaration during the Apollo years. It started on Christmas Eve, 1968, when Apollo 8 crew members Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders read a passage from the book of Genesis while becoming the first Americans to orbit the moon. When we had determined that we were going to be around the moon on uh, Christmas Eve, uh, we thought it'd be very appropriate to say something. But we really didn't know what to say. Uh, fortunately, there was a friend of ours uh, who had accompanied uh, several of the crews on their uh, world tours after their flights. And so he suggested reading from the Old Testament, the first 10 verses of Genesis, which is basically the foundation of many of the world's religions. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Apollo 8 was a very unique flight in many ways. First of all, of course, uh, the uh, Soviets at that time were planning to send uh, a cosmonaut on a Zahn spacecraft sometime in the fall of 1968. We heard about that, and that's why we sort of speeded up our own Apollo 8 flight. We finally uh, proved to the world that we could go to the moon. Borman and Anders and myself were the first three people to actually get to the moon, to see the far side of the moon. We looked out the windows, uh, but all we could see is a dark velvet sky. And then we rotated the spacecraft around about 180 degrees. And there, just below us, 60 miles, was the ancient old craters on the far side of the moon slowly slipping by. It was really the most remarkable sight that I have seen, perhaps the most awe-inspiring uh, uh, period of uh, my uh, space uh, career. After the resounding successes of Apollo 7, 8, and 9, the American space program was ready for its final dress rehearsal for the landing of the first men on the moon. Apollo 10 crew members Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan took their lunar module, nicknamed Snoopy, to within nine miles of the moon's surface. Sonny and I went down to eight to nine miles above the moon while John Young stayed up to 60 miles of the command module. We radar map, we photo map, we picked out that landing site where Neil would land uh, two minutes later. And we saw these boulders 
I'll never forget the boat. God, they were awesome. And there were boulders bigger in diameter than the World Trade Center was called. With the critical success of Apollo 10, the final step toward the moon was ready to be taken. When that one came back, then we knew that barring some, some unforeseen event, uh, we'd get to carry out uh, the world's greatest adventure as far as uh, technology and exploration goes. But America was still not alone in her quest for the moon. While Apollo was rehearsing for its planned lunar landing, the Russians had made an unmanned soft landing on its surface in their Luna 9 spacecraft. The Soviets had very good uh, efforts on security to keep everything secret. As they say in Polsky, at the Bolshoi secret. It's a big secret, okay? Everything's secret. I had no idea what, what they were actually doing. They sent some people over here to, uh, to talk to us, and we showed them uh, rendezvous and docking, but they weren't interested in that. What they wanted to see was how the lunar landing training vehicle was working. So I knew right then they really were serious about going to the moon. Little did we know that uh, a large rocket was poised on a launch stand in, uh, in Kazakhstan, ready to test the Russian launch system to see if they would be able to go to the moon and all the time it's getting closer and closer and closer and yes you bet we're worried about uh, something happening that might prevent that from that opportunity from, from uh, its fulfillment the world was ready and waiting for the greatest adventure in the history of man the first landing of a human on another planet it seemed like such a risk, such a courageous, unbelievably courageous kind of thing to attempt. I don't think there could have been any more exciting time in, in the history of man, perhaps, than that uh, around Cocoa Beach at the time that we were getting ready to launch man into space. And so Project Apollo to go to the moon became the single greatest cooperative effort short of war ever known to the human race. After centuries of only dreaming of a journey to the very surface of Earth's nearest neighbor, it seems science fiction is about to become science fact. If the Apollo 11 mission succeeds, President Kennedy's promise would be fulfilled, and mankind will have taken his first small step, his first giant leap toward the stars. There was a time not so very long ago when the age-old dream of flight became more than just a dream. It happened over 25 years ago on a Florida Cape called Canaveral. This is the place where man's greatest adventure began. On a day pretty much like today, one of man's oldest and most enduring dreams is about to become real. Three men are preparing to attempt a voyage to the moon to explore that distant world and return safely to Earth. It is a watershed moment in human history. If the mission succeeds, we will no longer be destined to live out the ages here on Earth. We will have taken our first step toward the stars. This was the biggest event that's gonna happen in, in history. Truly historic. The first time men were expected to travel to the moon and then land on the moon it seemed an impossibility. This is a culmination of everything that man has learned up until today. It is 4.30 a.m., July 16th, 1969. Three men, Neil Armstrong, Edwin Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, check their spacesuits for pressure leaks. Outside, television lights scatter the darkness. On Cocoa Beach, the mood of the countdown parties shifts from wild celebration to an almost unbearable suspense. Thousands have gathered along the road leading north. 3,000 journalists are there, a thousand more at Mission Control in Houston. More than a million people in all, the world stands poised for the greatest adventure in the history of mankind. 
I don't think there could have been any more exciting time in, in the history of man, perhaps, than uh, that uh, around Cocoa Beach at the time that we were getting ready to launch man into space and then succeeding in getting him into space. Uh, it, the, the, the tremendous uh, devotion of everybody there, every technician, the lowest janitor, right up to Werner von Braun and the, and the rocket scientists and the astronauts themselves, devoted to this one thing of, of exploring space, of getting out there, out, out beyond our own atmosphere. Uh, it was overwhelming. It, it, it just, it, it grabbed up everybody. The astronauts begin their journey. The white transfer van moves toward launch pad 39A. Three men and their machine are about to change the world forever. It seemed like such a risk, such a courageous, unbelievably courageous kind of thing to attempt uh, that uh, it was hard to, to believe it was going to happen. The number of things that can go wrong are so incredible that, that uh, sort of nobody in his right mind would do it. We ended up with an astronaut corps who really felt very strongly that they were capable of doing anything in the space environment. And uh, I've said, at times, uh, the feeling was, give us a, a white scarf and a jock strap, and we can do this mission. And all the time, it's getting closer and closer and closer. And yes, you bet we're worried about uh, something happening that might prevent that opportunity from, from uh, its fulfillment. The elevator rises. At 6.52 AM, Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin enter the spacecraft. The hatches are sealed. The astronauts are alone. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We passed the six minute mark in our countdown for Apollo 11, the flight to land of the first men on the moon. We're on time at the present time. At Mission Control in Houston, the flight control team has locked the doors and come to a status called Battle Short. The atmosphere in the room is filled with a strange blending of an almost cocky optimism and a nameless, relentless anxiety. And as I walked into this room that day, I felt uh, that something is going to happen here today. We're really going to go. We're not only going to try to do it, we're going to accomplish the first landing of a human on another planet. It's sort of an emotional time where you uh, sit down and you tell your controllers, hey, today uh, we're going to go to the moon. T minus one minute, 35 seconds. The vehicle starting to pressurize as far as the propellant tanks are concerned, and all is still go as we monitor our status for it. T minus 60 seconds and counting. The giant Saturn V rocket groans and wails and breathes vapor like a restless dragon. At mission control, the scientists, engineers, and doctors are concerned about the hazards of the unknown. We used to spend a lot of time practicing uh, our responses to, uh, to various kinds of failures and abnormal circumstances. The ones you worry about are the ones you didn't foresee and didn't properly prepare yourself for. I think most of us believe the Apollo uh, creed, which is if you practice and practice and practice, you can, you can get it right. And, uh, the training that, that NASA went through uh, in, in, in many ways is to prepare everyone, the astronauts and the, and the flight controllers and everybody else, for this, the fact that you're doing something that's ultimately absolutely crazy. T minus 40 seconds. Director of flight crews Deke Slayton is concerned about the astronauts' physical and mental condition. They are tired. The stress and long hours of pre-flight training have taken their toll. Yet the astronauts report they feel good. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. 
9.32 Eastern Time, the morning of July 16, 1969. The five Saturn F-1 engines heave the spacecraft skyward. In the first 8.9 seconds, they will consume more than 85,000 pounds of fuel. Sound waves pound the Earth like blows from Vulcan's hammer. Strapped securely in their spacecraft, astronauts Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin slowly begin their rise toward the heavens. We saw the light of the ignition, but the sound rolled across the, the desert and, and hit us like it, it had volume and, and uh, physical force. And it was a very emotional experience, truly emotional, because you knew there was a crew aboard and that these men were on a very, very dangerous mission. Probably no adventurer of man was ever launched with such uh, a physical tumult <laughs> as, as the launch of Saturn V carrying the uh, Apollo spacecraft. Uh, it, it came across with a tremendous roar. Uh, it seemed to be saying to us, it was Saturn V, it seemed to be announcing the importance of what we were all up to. That uh, this, this is us. This is us going. And this is what it takes to go. It seems almost unbelievable. A rocket is speeding toward the moon, carrying its human cargo to the very surface of Earth's nearest neighbor. After the tension of the launch, just getting that great beast off the ground, uh, the next major point was uh, maximum dynamic force going through the atmosphere. Uh, as it cleared that, then the separation of the, uh, of the boosters from the space vehicle. All of those things happened in sequence fairly quickly all part really of the tension of, uh, of launch itself. Then there was a long coach out, out to the moon. And our spacecraft was just rotating slowly. We could look out the window and, and see the moon go by slowly, very slowly, about, about one revolution a minute. And then after the moon would go by, the Earth would go by. <laughs> now that's marvelous. Once it was on a translunar trajectory, it would coast, perhaps it would make some mid-coast corrections, small velocity corrections to make sure it ended up at the right position. And then the next critical thing was getting into orbit around the moon. And we were all, I think, uh, everyone who knew the sequence of events and the importance of the sequence of events uh, were tuned very carefully to the monitors from the space uh, control at Houston. Uh, and from the spacecraft itself, obviously, of the sequence of events of getting into that orbit around the moon. And uh, there was always a moment of cheering as they made the, that successful transition into orbit. It is now 83 hours, two minutes into the Apollo 11 flight. The astronauts are ready to transfer to lunar module power. Roger, Eagle. You're looking good here. Yeah? Eagle. This is the first time the call sign has been heard during the mission. It echoes over the quarter of a million miles that separates the spacecraft from home. When the sun was uh, almost overhead and it was noon down below, the, uh, the moon appeared to be a, a warm and a friendly place. Uh, on the other hand, uh, near dawn or dusk, it became uh, very uh, foreboding looking. The uh, craters cast very long shadows and the place looked uh, distinctly unfriendly. The voyagers pass over the Sea of Fertility. It is Sunday, July 20th. 100 hours, 39 minutes, 50 seconds into the mission. Then we had to separate the LEM, the Lunar Excursion Module, from the, from the uh, spaceship itself, from Apollo 11. And that, uh, that was, uh, of course, the most critical, well, second most critical moment of all. Roger, Eagle, I'm Doc. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle has me. Roger. Roger, you're a go to, con you're a go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. 
Altitude now 21,000 feet, still looking very good. Velocity down now to 1,200 feet per second. You're looking great, uh, Deagle. We've now got 30 minutes from now to the time that we're going to actually uh, uh, put a man on the moon. And then pretty soon the guidance officer comes in and says, hey, flight, I got a problem. And one of the controllers in the loop, I've never found out who it is, uh, comes up and says, you know, this is almost like a simulation. Everybody just for a second relaxes, we smile, at which time we know we got it made. Because we always work best when we're having problems. Uh, we thrive in problems, we devour problems, we eat problems, we gobble them up. Uh, problems are what we're here for, we're the insurance. At a thousand feet, Armstrong takes over manual control of the LEM. He is now intently searching for the planned lunar landing site. We normally land with about uh, two minutes of fuel. And uh, we see this uh, indicator, it's like a warning light that comes on that says uh, two minutes uh, hover time fuel remaining. We would have normally landed by this time, but we know we're up and away. We get another call from my controller, 60 seconds, a very terse comment in the uplink from Charlie Duke to the crew. He just says 60 seconds. That's 60 seconds of fuel remaining. 60 seconds the crew has to find a spot to land or we're going to have to abort. The only time I ever slipped from that feeling of total confidence was that final five seconds when Armstrong and Aldrin were about to land on the moon and they were kicking up dust and the degrees. bells were going off because the computer had overloaded. Down, and at that moment, I said, this is so incredible. Down, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of details have all got to come together. It can't happen. This, 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 there's no human way this can all work. Okay, all flight controllers, go now, go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle, Houston, you're go for landing. Over. Head four forward, drift into the right a little. 30. 30, 30 seconds. Half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. To our best knowledge, we had between 7 and 17 seconds of fuel remaining at the uh, time that we actually landed. The touchdown itself, from my point of view, was a real high in terms of elation. Not so much for the instant, but because it marked the achievement that a third of a million people had been working for a decade to accomplish. And it was a feeling of we, third of a million people, managed it. The moment when the engine shut down and, and the checklist was essentially in comfortable status, we turned most things off, there was a moment when I could look over to Neil and, and we both looked at each other and, and I patted him on the back. And, and that was uh, a moment of realization for both of us that we just had pulled this thing off that people have been dreaming about for so long. And we were lucky enough to be two human beings picked to carry out this marvelous adventure. Well, Apollo 11, for me, was a completion of a dream. I'd always thought of mankind going out to, uh, to the moon, and it actually happened in my lifetime when I was relatively young. I uh, think it's going to turn out to be one of the key things in the future of mankind. When Apollo 11 landed, I was at, uh, in my home in Los Angeles, and I, re I remember vividly that night uh, stepping outside the house to uh, purposefully look up at the moon and study it, and see if I could see somebody up there. Obviously impossible. But um, the knowledge that there were humans standing on that planet um, gave me a whole new focus on, on space, the space program, my life, the life of the people around me. And that magic day 25 years ago when I said glued to the uh, television by epoxy resin. You couldn't get me away from it uh, for any reason on earth. Uh, 
even if there was no Madonna in those days, but if she had walked into the room much later, <laughs> uh, I, I was just holding my breath, and, and I had a microphone with me and a, um, uh, an audio cassette, and I thought, now, I, I don't know what in the world I will say when I actually see it happen, but uh, I want to record whatever I'm, I'm going to say. I had as long to prepare as anybody, and yet I found when the limb landed on the moon, I was virtually speechless. The things I thought I might say at that point were gone. All I could say was, golly. <laughs> From inside Eagle, Armstrong and Aldrin see the huge crater they had barely missed on their approach and landing. Everything around them is chalky gray. The sky is black. After a quiet lunch, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin prepare to step into an unknown world and take the most famous walk in human history. Roger, we copy. Pretty good little jump. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. I'm going to step off the lamb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. All right, that looked beautiful from here, when Neil Armstrong actually stood at the bottom rung of the ladder and then stepped out onto the moon, everything seemed to freeze. It's though time stopped. I can still remember that feeling of stasis. You know, this was the end, really, of history and the beginning of a new history. For me, for example, it was uh, very happy <laughs> because uh, first uh, time the man from Earth stepped to another planet. It's, it's really a good step. <laughs> Unfortunately, our project, Russian project, about flying to the moon was uh, finished. I walked out of Michigan Troll on a beautiful moonlight night. I looked up and realized that two of my neighbors were on the moon. As Armstrong, then Aldrin, stepped from the lunar module onto the surface of the moon, they enter a world never before explored by any man. Once when, when we were on the surface of the moon, as I looked out and had an opportunity to make some sort of an observation, the words magnificent desolation were extemporaneous as could be. I hadn't given them any thought ahead of time. But to me, they really did express the magnificence of what we as a species, as a human species, have just accomplished. Oh, that looks beautiful from here, Neil. It has a stark beauty all its own. During their lunar visit, Armstrong and Aldrin drill core samples in the moon's surface, photograph the surrounding terrain, and collect rock and soil samples. The two moonwalkers leave behind scientific instruments, an American flag, and a plaque commemorating man's first exploration of the moon. For those who haven't uh, read the plaque, uh, we'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this lamb. There's, there's two hemispheres, one showing each of the two hemispheres of Earth. Underneath it says, Dear men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, AD. It came in peace for all mankind. It has the, the crew members' signatures and the signature of the President of the United States. Man was on the moon. It is a watershed moment in history, and the world would never be the same again.